Hello, my name is Jambariki, and joining me for an interview is animator and director Elliot Bohr, who has contributed his animation skills to such films as Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Mulan, and Aladdin. He's also directed several Winnie the Pooh movies and the directed DVD sequel to The Emperor's New Groove, Kronk's New Groove. Thank you for taking the time to be interviewed, Elliot. Absolutely, my pleasure. Okay, let's go back to the beginning. What was your childhood like, Elliot? Uh, crazy. Now, my childhood, um, you know what? I was definitely one of those kids who was obsessed by animation. Um, you know, I was kind of a loner. I didn't have a whole lot of friends. And so I spent many, many hours in my room with the door shut making little animated films. Um, I, you know, I, I, my parents had gotten me the book, um, The Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, because as a kid all growing up, I would watch cartoons. I was you know, one of those kids who was so obsessed with Saturday morning cartoons that when I would get the TV guide, I would highlight all the shows that we were going to watch in order, starting at 6 a.m. and going till they finished. And, uh, you know, I think my parents realized early on that I was really, really interested in animation. And uh, my mom really encouraged me um, with my talent and brought me sketchbooks and brought me, you know, books about animation as well as put me in art classes on Saturdays. And I would just read through those books and I would sketch all day long in my, in my sketchbook. And then when I was turning 13, um, I asked my parents for my 13th birthday. I begged them to get me a Super 8 camera because I had seen this TV special about these kids who were doing animation frame by frame by frame using a Super 8 camera that could take single frame. And so I was very specific with my parents. I'm like, you got to get the Super 8 camera and you have to make sure it has a button on it where you can do single frame. Make sure. And uh, I was very fortunate because they indulged me and they ended up getting me this camera, which I then continued to make like 10 different Super 8 films with. I, you know, I took the camera, took it into my bedroom and just, you know, would, would take my action figures and do stop motion. And I would take, you know, uh, Silly Putty and make blob movies that would eat you know, all the, uh, my action figures or whatever, as well as I experimented with hand drawing, um, you know, sort of l really looking at the illusion of life and really reading it and absorbing it and understanding how animation was done. And um, I, I think that was pretty much my childhood in a nutshell. I really was obsessed by animation. I knew from a very early age that I really wanted to be a Disney animator. That's what I knew I wanted to do. And um I knew that basically I needed to take all the steps to get there. Unfortunately, I had very encouraging parents who, you know, um, really encouraged that in me and indulged me and helped me get there. So what was the next step? Did you take an academic animation course? Yeah, well, what had happened was um, my parents took me as, as I was in high school and getting ready for college. Um, my parents, you know, took me to visit a couple of different schools and I went and I visited CalArts um, uh, out in California, even though we were living in Florida at the time, um, we took a trip out to uh, California where I currently live, um, and, you know, saw CalArts and I really thought I was going to go to CalArts. Uh, but we also visited, um, a couple of schools in New York, Pratt and SVA. Um, and my mom had found this art teacher, um, who I could take additional classes with after high school. Um, so she was this private tutor and, um, you know, only took on like five or six students at a time. Um, and so after school, when I would get done high school, I would, you know, go over to her house and, and draw and paint and sculpt. And I really learned a lot about art that I had never done before. Well, with her, she basically said to me, look, I know you really want to work for Disney. But you don't want to just be a Disney clone. And if you, you know, she was concerned that if I went to CalArts, the Disney school, that I would just basically learn to draw like every other Disney artist and be a clone. And she really was encouraging me to, you know, go to art school where I would learn to watercolor and, and learn to sculpture and, you know, everything and illustration um, and then pursue animation. So I was more of a well-rounded artist. And so... In high school, when I sent my portfolio to all the different colleges, I ended up getting a really good scholarship from a few of them. But the best scholarship I got was from this school called the Columbus College of Art and Design, which is in Ohio. And I decided to go there and major in illustration. 
And I thought to myself, well, how am I ever going to end up at Disney? <laughs> and I had no clue. Um, but I went to school anyway and, you know, took all, you know, figure drawing classes and all this. And this is, this is like how the universe works. You know, I, I went to Columbus College of Art and Design. And after my second year there, Disney was opening a brand new studio, an animation studio in Florida at the Disney MGM Studios, which is now called the Disney Hollywood Studios. Um, and they picked 10 different schools from around the country to start recruiting students from to train them in their internship. And then, you know, start staffing up the studio. And guess what? My school was one of the 10. And so suddenly Disney came to me. And that's when I knew that I was meant to work at Disney because definitely it was, I was like, okay, I am applying. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get in. And so I did. And I was very fortunate that I got accepted um, in my senior year of college. So which was your first Disney animation that you worked on? Uh, well, what happened was is, uh, like I said, I was um, accepted to the Disney training program right out of my senior year of college. And, the, and when I got down to Florida, I trained for about three months learning animation and how to do cleanup, which is the process in 2D where you would take the animator's rough drawings, put another piece of paper over it, and draw a really nice version of it, you know, a cleaned up version. That's why it's called cleanup. And that's the drawing that actually gets photographed or scanned in for the movie and then colored in like a cell. Um, and so that was my first job at Disney. After I went through the training program, um, it was me and five other students um, who went through this training program. And all of us got hired, I think, except one person. Um, and, then the, and then at that time, they were working on Beauty and the Beast. And so I was fortunate that um, my, um, my mentor during the training program was the lead cleanup artist on Belle in Beauty and the Beast. Her name was Jennifer Oliver, and she was this really great uh, cleanup artist, one of the best. And I was very fortunate that I got to learn and work with her because I worked on the main character of the movie. Um, and uh, here I was, 21 years old, 22 years old, you know, drawing Belle in Beauty and the Beast. And I have to say, to this day, it's still one of the best memories of my life. And definitely, Beauty and the Beast is probably one of my all-time favorite Disney movies for that reason. Um, it was just such a great... I mean, imagine your first experience on this movie. Of course, we had no idea how big it was going to be or that it was going to get nominated for an Oscar, but uh, you knew you were working on a Disney movie, and to be working on one of the main characters was just really a thrill and a dream come true. What was it like working with the directors of Beauty and the Beast, Gary Trousdale and Kirk Wise? Yeah, it was pretty neat. You know, we were in Florida, so we didn't have a whole lot of... Um, you know, contact with the directors because they were out in California. However, here's kind of a funny story is that, you know, when you're young and you're only 22, you have a lot of chutzpah and, you know, you don't really know the way things work. And when I saw the first cut of Beating the Beast, I thought the ending could be a little better. I didn't really like the way they killed off Gaston. And so what I did was I actually thumbnailed out, I sketched out my version of what the ending would be. I was like, you know, I really think it should be this other bit. And uh, I actually then, um, I think I faxed it over to them, to the directors, <laughs> and uh, gave them my suggestion. I never heard back, but, um, but they did end up changing the ending, and it was very similar to what I had pitched. I'm sure a lot of people had the same note. Uh, I can't even remember what the original ending was, but a lot, I'm sure a lot of people had the same note. And, uh, you know, it's something that, looking back on it now, I'm like, who the heck did I think I was? But... Um, they were very they were very nice about it, and um, you know it's, Disney's a very collaborative pr place, so I felt like they didn't really have any egos about it or anything. And anyway, that's my little story about them. <laughs> what was the most difficult thing about serving as an animator for a major animated feature? You know, I would say that um, you know when I started, I was a cleanup artist. I started as as an in betweener on Beating the Beast, like basically the the entry level position was an in betweener. And then on Aladdin, I moved up to Breakdown, which is sort of um, one step above in betweener, but still in cleanup, basically. So you're not really animating yet. You're more or less cleaning up the animator's drawings. And then um, on The Lion King, which was my third movie there, I was a um, rough in betweener, which is now I moved into the animation side of things. And a rough in betweener is basically like an animator's assistant in a way where you're you know, you're adding more drawings to what they've animated to basically flesh it out and um, make it look smooth. Um, and then it wasn't until Mulan where I became a full-fledged animator. 
and I was animating the character Mulan with Mark Henn, who was the lead animator. And that was just a thrill and an amazing time of my life, too. And it was what, you know, finally my dream had come true. Here I was, a Disney animator, like I had dreamed about since I was a kid. However, what's so interesting was even though I was living out my dream and I was animating, I really found animating to be quite difficult for me. I don't think it really came that naturally to me, number one. But number two, I just found it very hard to sit you know, at a desk day after day and sort of draw the same thing over and over and over and over again. Because what happens in animation is you, you animate it once and then you, you know, you film it and then you look at it and then, you know, you decide, oh, that could be better, that could be better, and then you do it again. And then you show it to your lead animator and he gives notes and you do it again. And you show it to the directors and they give notes and you do it again. And I just felt like you're working on this one tiny part of the movie for weeks and you're doing it over and over and over and it just began to be very monotonous to me it wasn't a whole lot of fun and I have to say that that's when I realized that you know maybe working in animation the actual animating really wasn't for me um, and at the same time a friend of mine and I just for fun were making a little short film on the side we were storyboarding it we were recording voices we were designing the characters we were just doing this little short film more or less just for fun because we loved animation so much. And that's when I really began to realize that I loved the directing process more than I loved the animating process because the directing process allowed you to, you know, sort of do a whole lot more. Like you got, you got to put your finger in just about every part of the animation process. You weren't tied down to one specific thing. So that's, that's when I really, it was in animating for the first time of Mulan when I really realized that what I really loved was directing. And in 2004, you were granted the opportunity to direct your own Disney film, Springtime with Rue. How did the transition of Disney animator to Disney director come about? Well, what happened was, uh, very not very easily, I can tell you that much. So, uh, what happened was, in 1999, after I had finished Mulan, and they were beginning to gear up for Lilo and Stitch, um, I, uh, they asked me, you know, we want you to animate on Lilo and Stitch, and... You know, and, and I had worked with Andreas Deja a little bit prior to that on um, uh, the um, Kingdom of the Sun, which then became Emperor's New Groove. While it was still Kingdom of the Sun, I was animating Yzma with um, Andreas, and that was such a great experience too, but I began to feel really overwhelmed because I'm like, oh my gosh, four more years of my life, you know, spent animating on, on another movie, and I'm not really loving animating. Um, so what had happened was they were asking, uh, uh, for me to, you know, sort of sign on for Lilo and Stitch. And I was really at a crossroads in my life. I had just turned 30. This was 1999. And I said to myself, do I want to continue to animate for four more years or do I really want to try to pursue this directing, you know, something that I feel like I really love even more and challenges me more and excites me more. Unfortunately, at the Florida studio, there really weren't many opportunities for directing. There wasn't a clear path to director, sort of like there is at the bigger studio in California, where you start as a story artist and you sort of work your way up. And so I thought to myself, well, you know, a lot of animators leave, they go outside to the outside world, they get other directing experience, you know, and then they come back to Disney to direct, you know, once you have that outside experience. And so that's what I had decided to do. And I remember sitting down with the head of the studio at the time, in his office, and I said to him, I can't believe I'm about to say this because this is my dream job, but I'm going to be asked, I'm asking you to let me out of my contract so I can go pursue this directing career, and I hope one day I'll be back. And, you know, I left, you know, with not a job to go to or not a clue of how I was, this was going to happen. And um, my friend and I came out to California a couple times, and we kept knocking on the doors of all the animation studios and pitching ourselves as directors. Unfortunately, we didn't really have any experience. And so we would come back down, we would come back to Florida and go, uh oh, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, what have I done? And thinking, you know, what, what do we do? And then uh, my friend got this idea that we should go to New York and just look around there as well because there are some smaller animation studios there. And so we did. We took a trip to New York and we went to MTV. And at MTV, we pitched ourselves as directors, and we had pitched a couple of ideas and everything. And they said, well, you know what? There is a show right now that's looking for directors. It's called Spy Groove. And so we went down the hall, and we met with the people at Spy Groove, and they gave us this animation test. 
um, which was basically to storyboard out a sequence from the from the from the TV show um, before they could hire you, hire you as a director. So we came back down to Florida. We took the test. We sent it in, and about two weeks later, we heard back that they wanted us to come direct. And so Spy Groove was actually our first break into directing. And here we were moving to New York, and I'm thinking, never in a million years did I ever think I was moving to New York. And uh, but that was our actually our first experience directing. And after we did Spy Groove. Um, this show for MTV, which aired on MTV, uh, we then decided that, you know, we knew that Disney was in L.A. We needed to be in L.A. And at the time, we were talking with some of the folks over at Disney Toon Studios. And, but now we actually had directing experience. We had done this show. So they were more willing to take a chance on us. So we moved out to California. This was in 2002. And... Um, we started our first job at Disney Toon Studios, which was directing Winnie the Pooh, Springtime with Rue. Um, and uh, it was an amazing experience because it was our first feature-length experience. And here we were at Disney, where we wanted to be. Um, and uh, it was just – it was a great experience. You know, it, it, the movie, it came out, and, um, you know, we were really happy to be working on an old-school, you know, Winnie the Pooh. We tried to actually – they had done so many Winnie the Pooh movies that with Springtime with Rue, we decided to try to take you know Winnie the Pooh back to his roots. We wanted the narrator back. They had gotten rid of the narrator. We wanted the book transitions back where the characters would interact with the words on the page. They had gotten rid of that a long time ago. Um, and so that so Springtime with Rue was really our first Disney feature length directing experience. Now, you later went on to direct many other straight-to-DVD Disney sequels like Pooh's Heffalum, Halloween Movie, and Kronk's New Groove. Many people have accused Disney's sequels for marketing in on the success of hit theatricals features for solely commercial purposes. Would you agree with this accusation, or is there a deeper intention behind the process of making a Disney sequel or spin-off? Well, you know, I have to say that um, when I was working at Disney Feature Animation, we definitely kind of looked down our noses at what was going on at Disney Toon Studios. You know, we felt like these sequels were being made very cheap and they were, you know, not very inspired, a lot of them. And some of the stories really weren't that great. And yes, it seemed like it was just a way to cash in on the bigger theatrical movies. And some of the quality was very low. And so originally, when we had gone to pursue our directing career, we didn't want to go to Disney Toon Studios because we, we felt like we were taking a step down. However, um, when that became sort of our first opportunity to come back to Disney and, you know, direct a feature length movie, you know, when we took springtime with Rue, we took it with a little trepidation. However, when we got to the studio, we realized something that all of the artists there and all of the people working on these movies put just as much effort and love and passion into everything that they did that the artist at over at feature animation did sure maybe the movies weren't as good maybe the budgets weren't as big maybe the stories weren't as deep but still everybody threw themselves into the making of these movies equally and that really that really kind of changed our minds about these direct to dvd sequels maybe the end result wasn't as good as it could be because at the end of the day the direct to dvd sequels were made for much smaller budgets and made in much faster amounts of time you know, we had like uh, a quarter of the budget and a quarter of the time to make a feature. So it's almost impossible to try to make something as good that can compete with one of the Disney features. But I'm telling you that everybody who worked there genuinely tried to make it and elevate it as good as it can possibly be. And that's what made me realize, you know, from the outside looking in, it was easy to judge. But when you were on the inside, you know, you realized why it kind of was the way it was. However, um, after Kronk's New Groove, um, when we made that uh, movie, um, the studio went through a big change. And this is when um, Pixar made the deal with Disney, and then John Lasseter came in to oversee not only Pixar and Disney feature animation, but Disney Toon Studios as well. And I can tell you that um, Lasseter also had the same perception of Disney Toon Studios. In fact, I think his original intention was probably to shut the division down. But then when he saw the artist, as we did, and he saw everybody and how passionate they were to make these movies, they just weren't given you know, all the resources they could to make them as good as they could. Instead of shutting down the studio, he decided to recreate it in a new image. And that's what the new Disney Toon Studios, which began around, I would say, 2008, 
under the guidance of John Lasseter, the quality and the stories and the quality of animation and everything has just been raised so much under him. Now I've seen a picture of you stood next to two of Disney's nine old men, Frank Thomas and Dolly Johnston. What was it like meeting these two legends of animation? Oh, it was such a thrill. I am so happy I had a chance to sit down with them and talk with them before they passed away. The way that came about was when my directing partner and I were on Winnie the Pooh Springtime with Rue, and like I said earlier, we were trying to, you know, in, in you know, this was a very low budget direct to DVD sequel. However, we were still trying everything we could to bring Winnie the Pooh back to his roots from the original Winnie the Pooh movies that Frank and Ollie had worked on. And we, like I said, we wanted to bring the narrator back and the book transitions back. We wanted to bring the character designs back because they had strayed a little. And even the colors of the characters had changed over time. And we wanted to bring those back. And so we actually wanted to sit down with the two surviving nine old men and pick their brains about Winnie the Pooh. And so that came about because we, you know, spoke to them and said, hey, we're directing this Winnie the Pooh movie. We'd really love to hear your guys' thoughts about Pooh. Of course, that was also an excuse just to meet them. But uh, it was great because we got to come over to their house. And they were both so lovely and so wonderful and so generous with their time. And to sit there in the presence of these legends, because remember... When I was a kid, I had read The Illusion of Life, and that's part of what inspired me and started my journey down animation. And here I was sitting with the guys who wrote that book. Um, but to be able to talk to them about Winnie the Pooh and talk to them about what, how they saw these characters and how they saw, you know, what they saw in each of these characters and how simple-minded Pooh is and you know, Piglet and what his character is like. But also we got a chance to talk to them about a lot of other different things. And um, they were so nice. They showed us some animation drawings they had, you know, that they've kept over the years. So it just had stacks and stacks of things at their animation desk that they flipped through for us. And um, it was it was absolutely a thrill and one of definitely one of the highlights of my animation career to be able to spend time with them. And a short short time later, they both passed away. So I felt very fortunate we got that when we did. A lot of your films include musical numbers. How hard is it to adapt a song into a series of visuals? Yeah, that's a great question because it can be very challenging. I'll give you probably the best example is in Kronk's New Groove. Um, there is a song sequence um, to Earth, Wind, and Fire's uh, Let's Groove Tonight. And that song was a very tricky song because we knew it was the part of the movie where Kronk and his love interest are sort of beginning to fall in love. Um, and we didn't want it to be sappy. We didn't want to take it seriously because it's the Emperor's New Groove. You know, we wanted it to be funny. So we wanted all these really great gags in there. Um, but at the same time, we really wanted to choreograph this dance between Kronk and um, Miss Birdwell, who is his love interest. Um, and we wanted it to, you know, at first for you to think that, uh, of course, how could this big lug actually dance well? But it turns out he's this amazing dancer. And so what we ended up doing was uh, my directing partner and I both choreographed this song out, basically all the different moves that we wanted the characters to do. And we videoed ourselves, you know, um, dancing. Uh, you can see a little bit of it. There's a behind-the-scenes making of on DVD, and I, I think they show some clips from that. But um, we actually filmed all this dance reference of ourselves um, figuring this out, you know, as best as to our ability, you know, we're not cartoon characters, but at the same time, uh, and then we sat down and we plotted out where we wanted each gag to go. It was very difficult. That was one of the most challenging parts of that movie. Song sequences are difficult because you're trying to tell a story at the same time that you're trying to entertain and trying to, to, um, move the visuals along as well and keep it snappy and entertaining. And, um, they are, each song in and of itself is a little bit of a challenge. Um, uh, but it's something that's one of my most favorite things to do in a movie when I do get a song sequence is because it just gives you an opportunity to almost go into an imaginary world or try something completely different, um, you know, elevate it. You know, you kind of go into hyper reality, as I say. Um, it's not exactly the reality of when you're outside the song. Once you're in a song, you can kind of make things like if you look at Be Our Guest, for an example, I mean, there's so many cheats in that song, like instantly the room that they're in becomes a hundred stories tall and you know there's giant chandeliers that are swinging above you and you know the table becomes a mile long all of a sudden you know there's all these cheats that you can do in a song that maybe you couldn't do in the rest of the movie and that is a big thing that i like about them 
According to your website, you created the idea of a film called Mickey in Space. I've seen the animatic for this idea and was blown away. What happened? Why didn't this cartoon get made? Oh, yes. <laughs> That's one of the big regrets of my career. Um, uh, yes, while we were working on, I think it was Kronk's New Groove, at the same time we were doing Kronk's New Groove, there was this push at the studio to want to sort of reinvigorate Mickey Mouse. And they had started with the movie, um, um, I think it was The Three Mouseketeers, um, and to try to sort of launch more movies starring Mickey Mouse. And my directing partner and I, along with um, some of the writers and development execs at the studio, had this idea to want to do a Mickey in Space movie. Um, and partly to sort of sell the concept for what the movie could be, we made this little short that you can see on my website, um, just to show what a sort of Mickey in Space movie could be. And it was a really cool story, I have to say. I can't say much about it because it's all top secret, of course. Um, but unfortunately, what happened was that um, I think – I can't remember if it was that the, the Mickey and, and the Three Mouseketeers didn't do as well as they thought or – I can't remember what it was, but suddenly the appetite to want to do more Mickey movies just sort of went away. And we had been developing this idea for a year, and we had all these different concepts of it, and what it was, it was like Star Wars with Mickey Mouse, and it was going to have, you know, all this cool stuff in it. And then suddenly um, they said, yeah, good idea, but we're not interested anymore with doing much with Mickey Mouse. And then um, we just kind of got very sad because <laughs> it could have been a really cool idea. But it was, it's just one of those many things at Disney that gets developed but then never sees the light of day. Considering the amazing acting talents that have starred in your films, which include Jim Cummings, Caf Say, Eartha Kitt, David Ogden Stairs, Patrick Warburton, and the late John Fiedler, do you ever direct these voice actors? If so, what's the voice direction process like? Oh, yes. Um, I directed all of the actors that you mentioned. Um, the way that uh, the process works is um, basically the actor comes in to the recording studio, into the booth, and you know you're sort of you have a you have glass between the two of you, and they're on one side with the microphone, and you're on the other side with you know sort of a microphone there where you can give them direction. And um, basically, you go through the script and you read through the lines, and they maybe do each line maybe three times. Um, and then you can give them sort of direction of like, oh, he's really, really sad. Really think about that here or whatever. And then uh, eventually when you're in editorial, you're picking the best takes and editing, the, editing them in. Now, out of all the names that you mentioned, I, I also feel very, very fortunate and very lucky to have directed you know, someone like John Fiedler. In fact, um, we directed John for uh, the uh, Winnie the Pooh's um, Heffalump Halloween movie which was the last thing he did. He passed away very shortly after that, and we were the last directors to work with him. So I feel very fortunate about that as well, that we got to work with the, you know, the original voice of Piglet. It, it was really a great experience, and he was so nice and so sweet. Now with him, he actually was not in the studio. He was at home wherever he lived, and I only heard him kind of like I'm hearing you now over uh, ISDN line, which is like a phone line. And so we heard his voice. We didn't actually meet him in person. Um, as well as I got to direct Eartha Kitt in person. And now she has passed, since passed away as well. And that was such a thrill. In fact, um, for two of her recording sessions, we flew out to New York to record her there. That was for two of the songs for Kronk's New Groove. And she was just a hoot. I mean, while we were in New York, we got to see her one-woman show that she had that was going on at the time. Um, and she, you know, was performing in front of this whole audience, but specifically came over to our table at one point and sat on the table and sort of talked with us. You know, it was really a thrill. And she was so funny in real life. For an 80-year-old woman, she was hilarious and, and so sweet and professional. And just to get the chance to work with her was such a thrill. But I have to say that probably one of my most favorite people to work with and direct is probably Patrick Warburton. And since then, I've used him... Uh, Again, in um, uh, a movie that I made um, outside of Disney, The Little Engine That Could, he was one of the voices in that. But Patrick is just such a nice, funny, down-to-earth guy. For somebody who's such a big star, who's been on Seinfeld and he's had so many other shows since then, but he is just so down-to-earth and so nice, no ego whatsoever. 
and he'll just come in and he'll chat with you and you know and then you go in the booth and and sometimes I have to stop myself from laughing you know about everything he says because he's kind of exactly like Kronk in real life you know in real life he's like yeah that's right here we go all right let's go do this thing you know he's just like that <laughs> it's exactly who he is and um it's re- he's so much fun to direct because he'll basically do anything you ask of him and he has no ego about any of it so the voice directing process is always a really fun process for me because that's where the story from the page really starts to come to life and you start to see these characters take on a life of their own. Because up to that point, you're really just reading a script and storyboarding off of a script. But then when the actors come in and they add their life to it with, the, with these characters, suddenly these characters are now alive and they add so much more that then the animators can take and use to incorporate into their acting. Your co-director for most of your films was Saul Blinkoff. Can you describe what it was like working with him, and how did you share directing duties? Well, the way that we would split our duties was that um, Saul was really good at um, uh, color and background design. That was sort of something that he was very passionate about. And so for most of the... And and at Disney, when we were both at um, Disney Feature together... You know, I was the animator, and he was a lot more into, even though he was a cleanup artist, he was a lot more into sort of color and style and all that. So when we became directors together, that's kind of how we split up. I I mostly oversaw, like, the character designs and the animation, and he would mostly oversee sort of the layout and the background. And that's sort of how we split ourselves up. Now, granted, we would, of course, answer to each other, but we sort of split up as far as, like, what our passions were. And um, we had such a good time making these movies together because we were such big Disney fans. And, you know, Saul brings a lot of great energy to the process. And we had a lot of fun making these movies together. Um, And uh, the way that we would split things up just really worked perfectly. It was sort of like a good harmony to, uh, to do it that way. And then when we were in editorial, we both brought our own sensibility to things as well. When we're editing the movie, Saul very much got in tune with a lot of the emotional scenes or the romantic scenes, the things had a lot of heart. And my passion was a lot in the comedy and all the uh, slapstick and all the comedy scenes. So um, we, it, was a good, it was a good partnership in the sense that we both brought each of our strengths to the table in that sense. What would you say are the benefits gained from working for a major animation company? They have money. No. Um, yes, but that, that actually – I'm joking, but that's actually true. A major animation company, one of the big, big studios like Disney or DreamWorks or you know, you name any of the big ones, Pixar, is just the fact that they have these big budgets to work with where you can, you can execute your vision. It's much harder and more challenging when you're working with you know, sort of these much smaller budgets and much smaller time frames to try to execute the things genuinely that you want to do. Um, but in addition, you also, you know, these big studios tend to attract all the best talent, let's face it, you know, and so you're working with some of the best animators, best story artists, best everything in the industry, and so everything just gets elevated. Um, there's just more resources, more talent, more, um, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the higher ups, there's more support, there's just more support from, you know, the whole studio as a whole. I mean, like someplace at Disney, let's say, you have the whole marketing department behind you pushing your movie. You have, you know, this whole machine that makes toys and everything that can, you know, help promote the movie. So that's definitely one of the benefits working for one of the big studios is you just have a whole lot more support, a whole lot more talent, a whole lot more resources just to be able to take this thing that's taking four years of, or more of your life and ensure, almost, that it's going to be a success. Are there any downsides to working for a major animation company? Ah, great question. Yeah, you know, I have worked for both. I have worked for big animation studios, and I have worked for very small boutique animation studios. And I have to say there are genuinely things I like about both, because as nice as it is to have the big budgets and the time and the resources and the talent and all that stuff, a lot of times at the smaller boutique animation studios, you don't have as much pressure because of all of that. At the bigger animation studios, there's this pressure that your movie better be great, it better be successful, it better, 
you know, this, 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 this. And sometimes at the smaller boutique studios, you're left alone a little more to sort of make your movie the way you want without having to worry about whether it can sell toys or whether, you know, uh, it has this, this that little girls are going to like or these characters in there that boys are going to like or, you know, you, you at a big machine like Disney, you definitely have to be thinking about, you know, well, is this going to be able to sell toys or is this going to be able to do this? At a smaller boutique studio... Uh, I've found that more often than not, you kind of get left alone to kind of make the movie you want to make and not have to worry about all that. Also, because there's less time and less money, you have to be, you have to be more creative in a, in a way. You have to figure out, okay, I only have twenty thousand dollars, you know, to do this, or twenty, you know, million dollars to make this movie instead of a hundred million dollars. Um, how am I going to pull off something that still looks spectacular? I have to say that some of my best training as a director has come from working on the lower budget productions um, because of that very fact. Because I was forced to have to, you know, um, be much more creative with how you do, like, let's say, a big action sequence or these big effect sequences. Well, you don't have the money to do that, so what do you do? How can you, you know, be creative uh, in a storytelling sense to be able to pull off that same feel, even if you don't have the money to literally you know, executed on screen. And um, I think that sometimes for the smaller boutique studios, it's really good training ground for young directors for, you know, getting their feet wet, getting experience. Um, even young animators or anybody who is starting out in the industry to work for these smaller studios first because it really does give you this appreciation for having to be creative and think on your feet without all the budgets and the resources so that when you go to a bigger studio... You're more appreciative of it, but you also don't squander it. Back when you served as an animator for Disney, what were the hours like? Um, it varied. Uh, depending on, you know, when your scene was due, it could be that, um, you know, sometimes you would have to work a lot of overtime, you know, to get your scene done by the deadline. Um, but for a lot of animators who, you know, maybe they had been doing this for a really long time and they were used to this, they could kind of you know, draw their scenes and churn out their scenes in a pretty good amount of time and not have to sweat it too much. But it was generally, you know, like generally 9 to 6 kind of thing, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. for the most part. But there was definitely, you know, even now as a director, there's overtime. Um, every great once in a while, you may have to come in for a few, hour, few hours on the weekend to work as well, depending on if you have a deadline looming. I would say for the most part in the animation industry, for the most part, it's generally a 40-hour week. However, once you start getting to where you're have, trying to hit a deadline, whether it's you're trying to hit a screening um, and you, know, you don't have much time to do it, suddenly you're now working an 80-hour week. Suddenly you're now working your weekends and overtime and all that stuff, which is good money, of course, if you're getting paid overtime, um, but definitely can make for where you're eat, sleeping, and breathing work and not having much of a life. Many fans of the original Winnie the Pooh books really don't like the changes that Disney did to its source material. How do you personally feel about Disney's version of A.L. Milne's characters and world? You know, I have to say, I was ne I grew up um, with Disney's version of Winnie the Pooh, so I was never, like, it's not as if I had the books first and then, you know, saw the change from Disney. The, the ones I grew up with was, you know, Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2 and you know, um, all the original Winnie the Pooh movies that Disney had done. So that was kind of my version of it. In fact, for me, it's a little bit of the opposite. You know, when I go to read the books, for sometimes I'm always comparing it to the movies, and it's like, well, wait a minute. Yeah, the book came first. Um, but I do agree that there has to be a definite balance between, you know, trying to remain true to the source material. At the same time, it's animation. And a lot of times you have to change things in order to make it entertaining on the screen, something that may read one way on the page may not necessarily come off the same way on the screen. And at the end of the day, you're trying to make entertainment and not necessarily make a faithful adaptation of something that once translated in animation may not be as entertaining. So I sort of see it both ways. I definitely think there has to be a reverence and there has to be honoring the, the original source material. At the same time, I think Disney has sort of taking Winnie the Pooh, it's almost like Winnie the Pooh in an alternate dimension, you know, it's like, sort of like, you know, it's Disney's version, and so you have the book, and then you have Disney's version, and there are two things that are similar that maybe are just in two parallel dimensions in my head, maybe. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who really wants to work at an animation studio? 
Well, one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give is definitely, um, you know, the first thing is whether you want to be um, a CG animator, whether you want to work in Maya, whether you want to be a 2D animator, whether you want to be a stop motion animator, it definitely all starts with being able to draw, I think, at the end of the day. Now, I know a lot of CG animators, well, it's like, well, wait a minute, but I don't have to draw. But the best CG animators are ones who are really great 2D animators as well, who are really good at figure drawing and animal drawing. So one of the first basic things I tell everybody is to draw, 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 is definitely to get really good at anatomy, whether it's animal anatomy or human anatomy, you know, drawing people, drawing animals. Just be a really well-rounded artist, and it will elevate everything else you do. That's the first thing I tell people. The second thing I tell people is it takes a lot of perseverance. No doubt about it, everything in the entertainment industry takes patience and perseverance because it's extremely competitive, and it's extremely difficult to get into. And um, a, a lot of what it takes is being able to uh, endure a rejection, endure at being rejected after rejected, rejected. Like I said... When um, Saul and I were first going towards a directing career, we were rejected way more than any job that we got, you know? And it was a lot of that, having to pick yourself back up and keep moving forward and pick yourself up and keep moving forward and keep trying hard. But I think anybody that is really talented, that has, you know, the ability to persevere through all of that, but also is really good, I mean, talent rises to the top. Eventually, if you are really good and you are really talented, you will make it in this industry and you will get a job. But for most people, it's going to take a lot of perseverance and trying again and trying again and constantly trying to better yourself, constantly trying to up your game. If you have an animation reel and let's say you're waiting to get a job in the industry and you're sending out your, your reel and you're waiting weeks and weeks, well, don't just sit there and wait for the phone to ring. You should be working on more animation tests, you know, do a dialogue test, do more acting, like never stop because everything that you add to your animation reel is only going to make it better the next time you send it out. Um, and so I think that's probably the biggest advice I can give people is, you know, continue to always improve, improve, improve yourself, work at it, work at it, work at it. At the same time, realize that sometimes it takes time to get into the animation industry and it takes a lot of patience and perseverance as well. What would you really like to accomplish in the future one day? One of the biggest goals for me right now is to eventually get to a big budget theatrical feature. I think that that for me is my ultimate goal is to have, you know, uh, a movie that plays in the theaters to a much wider audience than anything that I've done previously based on uh, an original story that comes out of my heart. Most of what I've worked on up until now have been stories that are either based on something or, you know, they're sequels to something else. And as much as I love that and I enjoy doing that and I really genuinely enjoy working at Disney Tune and all the projects that I'm doing right now, I eventually do, of course, I think for every director, want that big movie that you can sit in a movie theater and really listen to an audience enjoy something that you've created. Because for me, that's really where the most pleasure comes from. One of the downsides to making movies that come out on DVD is it's almost a little bit of a letdown when your movie comes out because you never get to experience it with anybody. It goes out there and, you know, you, unless you're, you know, going to your family and watching the DVD with them, you don't get that experience of sitting in a theater and hearing people laugh and cry and applaud and whatever at something that you've created up on the big screen. And I really do look forward to that experience one day. Well, thank you for taking the time to be interviewed, Elliot. Absolutely, my pleasure. You gave some wonderful answers. Well, thank you so much for asking me. I really appreciate it.